Welcome, everyone. It is such an honor and a pleasure to welcome back uh, distinguished alumnus and friend, Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson. Uh, the audience is filled with uh, old friends and new, former clerks, current clerks, future clerks, former colleagues. Um, I, I, hope, I hope it's pleasing to you. Um, I'm going to introduce Judge Wilkinson, and then he and I will have a conversation. So first, I'll, I'll, I'll embarrass him. Uh, Judge Wilkinson graduated. Should I stand for this part? I'll stand for this part so you can all see me. Judge Wilkinson graduated from Yale University in 1967, uh, and he went into the Army for a year in 1968 and 1969. He then attended the University of Virginia School of Law, graduating in 1972, but not before he was a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives from Virginia in 1970. That's during law school, right? Um, and I'm going to ask him about that. Maybe he'll talk to us about it a little bit. Um, after graduating, Judge Wilkinson served uh, as a law clerk to Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. on the Supreme Court of the United States in 1972 and 1973. He then came back to the University of Virginia School of Law and served as a, an associate professor from 1973 to 1978, at which time he became the editorial page editor of the Norfolk Virginian Pilot uh, from 1978 to 1981. He then served as Deputy Assistant U.S. Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice and returned for a stint back here to the law school uh, before Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, appointed him to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in 1984. One thing to say as you look at this resume and how impressive Judge Wilkinson has been in every realm of government and life and uh, journalism and everywhere he has gone, uh, I don't want you to, um, to come away not knowing that he was a stellar teacher. Uh, and in one of the articles about his nomination to the bench, then Dean of the Law School Dick Merrill was asked about him and he said the following, students berate us when we move him into a smaller classroom. Uh, so he was uh, as wonderful uh, a teacher as he was a lawyer and a judge. Between 1996 and 2003, uh, Judge Wilkinson served as chief judge of the Fourth Circuit, and he remains on the bench today. In 2004, the University of Virginia awarded Judge Wilkinson the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Law, which is our highest external honor. Some of you may have been here last week uh, when we gave that honor to Judge Easterbrook. Judge Wilkinson received that honor in 2004. In 2017, he was awarded the Rule of Law Award by the Virginia Holocaust Museum and the Virginia Law Foundation. Judge Wilkinson has not only been a lawyer and a judge and a professor, he has also been a writer. He has written six books on the law, on politics, on his own experiences, on the judiciary, and I'll name them for you so that you can see what a wide scope they have had. Harry Byrd and the Changing Face of Virginia Politics, 1945 to 1966, Serving Justice, a Supreme Court Clerk's View, One Nation Indivisible, How Ethnic Separatism Threatens America, From Brown to Bakke, The Supreme Court and School Integration, 1954 to 1978. I will say that book was my first introduction to Judge Wilkinson before I knew him as a person. I knew him as the author of that book. Uh, Cosmic Constitutional Theory, Why Americans Are Losing Their Inalienable Right to Self-Governance, and most recently, in the book we're here to discuss, all Falling Faiths, Reflections on the Promise and Failure of the 1960s. Before we move on to talk about the book, uh, I want to say just a little bit about Judge Wilkinson as a judge. He has been described as, quote, one of the most distinguished and highly respected members of the federal judiciary. He believes, and this is a quote from him, in a certain modesty and restraint on the part of a judge. This is one of my favorite quotes. He said, a judge ought to look at his role like playing a part in a symphony. We are part of a larger effort playing in concert if you will, with Congress, with administrative agencies, with state courts, with the private sector, and with the executive branch of government. For our system of government to work, one part of that symphony, the courts, has to respect the role of the others. And that means, and he says, when I approach a case, the first question I ask is not what do I decide, but whether I am the one to decide it. That is fundamental. 
I could go on with more compliments about Judge Wilkinson and more profound quotes by him, but we are here to hear him, here to hear him discuss his most recent book. As you can already tell from the quotes I've just given you, Judge Wilkinson is an elegant and evocative speaker and writer. That writing is fully on display in All Falling Face, which is a moving and very honest and deeply felt book. One reviewer called it, quote, a small gem in the literature of the 60s. I like that quote. Uh, the book, by the way, is available in the bookstore if you feel moved. Uh, as the title suggests, though identifying the good that had come out of the 60s, the book focuses much more on what was lost and still not been regained. And so with that, I will take my seat and, uh, and start asking some questions. Join me in welcoming Judge Wilkinson. Thank you. That Thank was you. lovely. Thank you. So let's start. I think we're going to focus more. Well, I mean, I'm not, not oh, going to let ahead. you go, dive into the <laughs> questions without uh, saying a few words of my own about you. Uh oh. That, that, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I want you. You have uh, followed some titans as dean with with Bob Scott and John Jeffries and Paul Mahoney and everything, and you have come to the law school and, and your leadership has generated so much excitement and enthusiasm and energy, and I hear it at every turn. And you make me proud to be a member of this law school community with the leadership you're showing and the job that you're doing. And it wasn't just because of that nice introduction <laughs> that I said these things. I have had this on my mind and looked for an occasion <laughs> to say it and to, to tell you how much I respect you and how much I value your friendship. I've looked for an occasion for a long time and it has come. Thank you. <laughs> that is very, very kind of you. <laughs> I feel the same way, and I think you know that, and, uh, and it makes me proud to be dean of the law school that, uh, that can claim you. So, and I, I too, am, uh, I love our friendship, and it makes me really happy, so thank you. Now, can I jump into the questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it doesn't have to be so formal, but I thought the first thing would be to share something about the book uh, for those who have not yet read it, um, something about the gains, something about the losses, uh, something about, you know, your vision of, of the 60s and, and what the decade brought. Well, the main thing I wanted to do it, 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 about the book, it seems to me that so much of the discussion about the 1960s, it's a, it's a decade that passionately divides people. And um, so much of the discussion about it has just been um, shouted. People mounting the ramparts, uh, throwing oranges at each other. Um, and so I felt, well, I need to take... Um, a little different approach. And I thought, well, maybe I would approach it um, not with, as a series of essays, and I'm not going to approach it in a didactic way. I wanted to approach it as a memoir and um, write as very, as, as personally as I possibly could um, to just uh, lay myself on the line. Because I don't think you can persuade anybody unless you're honest with yourself and unless you um, uh, write a memoir, the thing that the reader is looking for um, are two things. First of all, honesty. And second of all, are you really revealing yourself or are you protecting yourself? And I'm, I, I hope I reveal myself um, even when it was, was painful to do so. Um, some, sometimes when I thought back about the 1960s, um, I, I, I was angry. Um, other times I, um, I was uh, um, I just was, would, would uh, you know, would smile about it, thinking about the people I knew. And, and sometimes I would smile through my tears. Um, writing personally is 
very hard thing to do. Um, they, they say that memoirs are for people who are too lazy to keep diaries. And uh, I suppose that um, is true in a way, but I encourage all of you uh, at some point in your life to, to write a memoir, or at least recollections of your own life. Um, and um, I wanted, one of the reasons I wanted to do that was in these very personal terms to address my own generation and say, look, we did some good things in the 1960s, but we did some terrible things in dividing this country. Um, and we need to spend the remaining years of our life um, in, an, in, in an act of healing, if that's possible, bridging differences, if that's possible, respecting one another, if that's possible. And maybe I'm naive, but wouldn't it be good if a, if a generation that in its youth did a great deal to tear a nation apart in our latter years, we would do a great deal and devote ourselves or at least some part of the finite energy that's left to us on healing. And um, it, um, uh, we, we need to do this before we leave life in Shakespeare's stage for good. But it wasn't just speaking to my contemporaries. I, I wanted to speak to upcoming generations, and most of the talks I've given have been to students and upcoming generations. I want to say, okay, look, um, here are the good things we did. Um, try to build on those, and here are the mistakes we've made, and we made some serious mistakes. Please don't repeat them, um, but learn from us just as we're trying to learn from you. So I'm addressing my contemporaries. I'm addressing um, the uh, upcoming generations, um, law students, undergraduate students. And there's a third group of people I wanted to address too, and that is those little grandchildren of mine. Um, I couldn't believe when I got to middle age how little I knew about my grandparents and my great-grandparents. And I found out things about them, like I was named after my a great grandparent, uh, uh, the man who rescued my great grandfather from a raging stream at the very last minute. And uh, that my mother was born when my grandma was 45 years old in 1915, which was almost unheard of. And so I say, you know, this rescue scene in, my, in the uh, advance for that time, age of my. Um, mother's birth, I'm really lucky to be here. Um, one chance in a million or a billion that each of us arrives on this earth when you look at the chain of causation that finally places us here. And, um, and so I, I wanted my grandchildren and, and great-grandchildren to know more about Lassie who is here and myself than I knew about my ancestors. And a, a, a memoir is a good way to put your grandchildren and great-grandchildren in touch with you. And so, yes, it's contemporaries, it's younger folks, and it's reaching across the generations. And there's a story to tell about the 1960s, and it ought to be told to a lot of different people at a lot of different ages. That's what I've tried to do. Wonderful. So I, I have some questions about the, the writing of it and the voice, but I, but I think maybe before we get there, maybe to talk a little bit about the substance of what you say about the 60s. Well, I, I, I try to talk <clears throat> about um, the... The, the damage that I believe, I, I believe that the 60s did a, a good deal of good in, in making um, America a nation for all of us, not just some of us. And so you have to give the 1960s credit for that, and you have to respect 
Those wonderful civil rights statutes, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Fair Housing Act, there are contributions that the 60s made, but I also think it, um, it did a great deal of damage and that that damage lives with us um, today. Cause and effect is never simple. Um, it's, it's multiplicitous, whether it's cause in fact or proximate cause or what have you. Um, but I, I try in a very personal way to show, okay, I was going through Yale in the 1960s and I saw a great deal of damage inflicted upon education as, a, as an enterprise of disinterested inquiry. And I wanted to make that clear again in a personal way. And then I go into the um, sexual re revolution, why it happened, what the impact of it is today for, uh, for, family, uh, for family stability and family units. And then I go into the rule of law in my years in law school um, and talk about the damage the 1960s inflicted in all kinds of different ways and from all kinds of different quarters on the rule of law and what it was like to be at the University of Virginia during those years um, and having all of these different events of the 1960s crashing down on me while I was trying to get a legal education. And then I wanted to talk about my childhood and growing up and the whole notion of home and that the 60s, I, th I think, um, began to loosen the bonds we have with our home. It's for good or bad, and, and our homes have lots of good and lots of bad, but whatever else home is, home is you. And if the 60s loosen those bonds between us and our home and a place that we always feel is a place of belonging and a place of we can go back to, I thought that was not good. And then um, I had talked about my experience in the um, Army and uh, what, what, what that was like and the way in which the Vietnam War and the Army tore at our sense of national unity. Um, and um, uh, put us in the, that and many other developments, but Vietnam was a big part of it all, have now put us in a position where we we're so polarized. And if an, if an existential moment arrives for this country, do we still have the common bonds and do we still have the mutual respect for one another to pull it together? And I'm not, given this present environment, not all that sure. And then I wanted to go finally into the place of religious faith and what my childhood was like and how religious faith was defined for someone growing up in a very traditional society and how the 1960s challenged that whole, challenge my religious faith um, uh, to, its, to its very core and its very fundamentals and what that has meant for society too. Whatever one's faith, the weakening of faith brought about, I think, by the 1960s has, not, has been harmful. And so the totality of all of this, which you may disagree with, but I try to convey it personally in the belief that, you know, I grew up in one set of circumstances. Everybody in this room grew up in a unique set of circumstances, but I feel like we all have things to share about our lives that other people will understand. And I, am, I, I got to the point where these last few years, I was seeing the 1960s come back again, um, that had gone into remission for a while, but now it was coming back. And um, I just felt like I had to put all this down and say, okay, here's what we lost. Um, here's some things that we as a society want to try to recover. Um, and, and so um, 
that was it. I had little bits and papers and scraps around the room where I'd you know, written little personal notes and jottings, and it was a mess. And Lizzie said, what are you doing with all these little scraps of paper around the room? I said, I don't know, just, they're just there. And then in 2015, when 2015, when I thought the 60s are you know, staging an encore, that I was going to put it together and try to draw it together in a book. Wonderful. So that was a, a beautiful description that took you through, really, the whole book. And as a result, I want to ask every question that I have on my list all at once. But, um, but I think I'm going to start with this one, which is where you ended. So as a historian, I think a lot about when we start stories and when we end stories and, um, and what it means for the conclusions that we draw. So if you had written this book 10 years ago or 20 years ago, if you'd written it in the 80s, do you think the conclusions you would have drawn about the 60s would have been the same? Or do you think it's really because of the moment that we're in now and its polarization and, um, and seeing similar kinds of activities that make you think it's the 60s resurgent? Do you think you, you would, you know, there's the, the causation, right, that it's the 60s that have led us to this place. Do you think that would be as prominent for you if you had written this book at a different moment? Uh, no, not as prominent, uh, the, but the, you could take um, any point in time from 1968 or 1970 to the present, and you can take any point in time and, and point out the losses. But your question is a good one, because the, um, the events of the last few years have made the problem acute. And they have sort of painted in, in vivid detail um, the trends of the 1960s in many instances repeating themselves. But um, it would have been it would not have been as sharp a recognition in 1985 or 1995. But oddly enough, even because the people in many positions of leadership are still baby boomers who lived through the 1960s and, and still drew on their experiences and, and, and everything, the, I, I'll be blunt about it, the, the political, the, the, the events of the past few years, the, the, the police clashes uh, with minority groups, the, up, the uh, r r r regrettable uprisings in places such as, as Baltimore and Ferguson, um, the um, uh, deep polarization in, in, the, um, in the political body, uh, the disturbances on campus um, where uh, Berkeley, for example, had to spend two and, two and a half million dollars to, just to, to safeguard um, free speech, and, and, and uh, some, some speakers were, uh, were roughed up and, 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 and shouted down. Um, there were um, uh, all of these things, even the uh, 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 these horrible events, like in Parkland and, and Las Vegas, and, and, and a little bit earlier in Newtown, brought to my mind back um, those 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 terrible assassinations. So it might not have been that yeah that you could have pointed a lot, but in the last just from about 2014 or 15 onward is where the, where the problem has, has, where the 60s have resurfaced and the problem has become acute. So I'm curious about the relationship between the losses you see and the gains. Um, and I, I think, when I think about the literature of the 60s, I think... Um, the losses and the gains are, are, I think, always both present, but their emphasis differs for different people. Um, and I think for you, the losses um, 
weigh a lot more heavily. Um, but there, my question is whether the losses are necessary for the gains that you see. Um, and there are two sentences I wanted, well, three sentences I wanted to read, one which is on a personal level and one which is more global. So there's one personal statement that you say. You say, maybe someone's loss of privilege is another's gain in dignity. Perhaps there is a selfishness in every song of lament. Um, and on the more global level, you say, one can forever debate racial progress in America and whether that whole inferno of a decade was required to achieve it. And I, I wonder where you come down on that. I mean, the, the changes that you, that you praise and you commend and you point to did they have to come at, with the losses? W what was the way forward for, for changes that were that monumental um, to happen without the losses? How does that, what does that look like? Well, um, uh, uh, it's a very good question. I've had it posed to me a, a number of times, um, and that is that, that there had to be a huge earthquake, a huge disruption in society um, in order for the injustices to be uh, uprooted and for progress to have been made, that, that gradualism would never have accomplished what the seismic shocks of the 1960s did. And then it's a, that, that um, uh, Violence of some sort was necessary to achieve recognition of injustice and disruption of campus activities was necessary to realize the evil of the war in Vietnam and, and, and that. And so I've, I've grappled with, you know, were the 60s necessary to achieve, to, uh, were the, was, was all the volcanic nature of the decade necessary? To, to uh, achieve the, the, the progress. And, I, you know, the, the question was posed to me, well, if there hadn't been the, the riots in Watts and Newark and Detroit and, and, uh, um, and, the, and Chicago and the rest, uh, we wouldn't have drawn attention to civil rights and to the uh, uh, very unfortunate condition of the dispossessed. And what is something I have, it's hard, been hard for me to figure out, was that all the violence and disruption um, occurred at a time in the 1960s when, when the legal system was actually working. And it was working, and when peaceful demonstrations were actually uh, working, where um, the most effective steps in the 1960s were not violence, were not riots. Uh, they were the march from Selma to Montgomery and the march on Washington. The congressional branch was working um, in passing these civil rights acts I've, I have referred to. The judicial branch was working through the Warren Court and the sequel cases to uh, Brown v. Board of Education and knocking down uh, uh, segregated barriers um, at every turn. And so uh, I, I think one of, the, one of the failures of the 1960s was uh, oddly that that, that the established processes were actually producing huge results, much more so than, the, than, I, than I think the, the riots and campus disruptions were. Um, and, and, and peaceful demonstrations, such as the sit-ins at, uh, at the Greensboro Woolworth, that was producing results. So why didn't the 1960s give a system that was working? You know, why didn't, we, why didn't we give it a chance? And by not giving it a chance, and by having um, these unfortunate riots, and, and, and by having canceled classes and seized microphones and, and um, occupied administration buildings on campus, 
we gave rise to a very, very dangerous notion, which is that people didn't have to give, didn't have to show patience with uh, established legal procedures and, and, and congressional and legislative procedures, even when they were working. It was okay to do what you felt was right and just take law into your own hands and not abide by the general and community judgments. And it was that impatience with a system that actually was bearing great fruit um, that is one of the dilemmas of this whole decade that I'm trying to work through. And um, it is it just talk a little bit personally, if I may, Risa, about the time in, in law school. Uh, it was, um, there's a, a figure in, in, in my uh, discussion of UVA Law School, and I refer to him as the, as the dean. Not identified, just the no, dean with a capital D. And so when I started talking to my editor, um, the editor said, you've got to identify the dean. You've got to give his name. Uh, one of your distant ancestors. <laughs> you can look up easily enough and find out who was dean of the University of Virginia Law School, okay, in, in um, 1968, 1967. And I said, no, the dean is too august a figure to ever name that would bring him down to earth. And he embodied for me the most noble conception of the law, the most classical conception of the law. It was like the Acropolis or something. And I will never forget the opening comments that the dean made about the the law being the riverbanks through which the currents flow, uh, society flowed in the dean. Then he started just waxing eloquent, and he said, property law protects our possessions. Uh, domestic relations law protects hearth and home. Um, contracts protects commercial uh, expectations. Um, the criminal law protects our safety. Constitutional law protects our liberty. Tort law protects our security. And he went on and on. You know, he made a complete believer on me and uh, of me. And I and I. So I entered this and said, you know, the law is it this elevated place. And then I kept looking at the dean and and he was and i began to wonder is he tone deaf does he does he realize what's happening outside this building it was clark hall at the time um so it it comes down in the final stages of my first year in law school i was preparing for my contracts exam um and I was, um, I was re uh, 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 trying to master Article 2 and Article 9 of the universe, uh, Uniform Commercial Code um, and trying to understand whether you should hold minors to contracts when they've, the adult party is negotiating in good faith. I was really studying hard. And <laughs> right at the moment when I was sort of getting into it, um, the television flashed on and I, I saw the footage of Robert, Robert Kennedy being assassinated. The assassination of Robert Kennedy came at the end of our first year in law, in law school, um, right on the eve of my contracts exam. And so um, I, I, I put the contracts book aside because of the magnitude of this event and was just watching the television 
trying to comprehend it all. And I was talking with some of the members of my study group, and they said, well, we don't need to worry about this. He's, uh, the exam's not going to take place tomorrow, so we can put this aside because this is too much of a jolt and a shock for all of us, and we, we weren't going to um, sort of diminish it by just going on as nothing had happened and going to an exam. And I woke up the next morning to the news that the exam was still on. And when I was going, the dean was a contracts teacher, and when I was, when I was going to class, and I was going to the law school, I saw the dean walking up those steps under this glorious motto, and then I'm thinking to myself, surely he's not gonna go through with this thing. Does he even realize What's happened? Is he so committed to this, to his faith in the law that it becomes impervious even to the evidence of the law's disintegration that is going on throughout this decade outside these walls? And I'm struggling with this whole notion and I've continued, I struggle with it in law school, and I've continued to struggle with it as a judge. How does one maintain faith in the law and its promise and what it's supposed to represent to us all when there are events outside of law school and outside of the courtroom that show law to be such a distinctly limited mechanism um, to deal with all the full gravity of society's ills. And so I come back to what, the, how did the dean maintain his faith? How do I as a judge maintain my faith when you say, well, I can award damages, I can issue it if we're to issue an injunction, I can do these things, but they're they're limited. And it's the same question I think that many many of us feel with respect to religion. How does one maintain faith in something that matters a great deal to you when, when there's so much going on that's inconsistent with everything law or religious faith of whatever is supposed to represent? So I struggle with this throughout the memoir, and um, you know, I, 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 I tried to do what I could, and I said, how did the dean maintain the faith? And I, I don't know, I guess, I guess where I come down to it all in the, in the end is that for all its limitations, law remains the best hope we have, and my God, what would we be without it? Um, how, how, how much worse and more unmanageable would the, would the chaos be without it? It's not a totally satisfactory answer. And it's, it's something that um, I struggle with in law school, and I thought it would outgrow the struggle, but it's just, uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm sitting in court, I, 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 I recognize uh, the limitations of the law, and yet it's it's still in some ways our, our, our best hope. And maybe that's the way the dean looked at it, but he was such a mysterious character, I'll never know. That's how you all feel about me, right? <laughs> mysterious, reverential. No, I don't, I don't think. Anyway, um, so speaking of law school, I wonder if you would share for everyone what made you run for Congress as a law student. And I know that some of our students, in part in response to what you just said about feeling the limits of the law. Um, some of our students are anxious to go out in the world and, and do other things, and, uh, and, and I wonder if you could share that experience with them. Uh, I, guess, um, I guess I was just restless. Um, it, um, I'd worked in a lot of political campaigns, and, 
and I saw the candidates making eight or nine stops a day and pursuing this vigorous itinerary and meeting all kinds of people and going here and there and everything. And all I was doing, all I was doing was moving from class to class, moving across the hall. Um, and so when you're motionless and the world around you is in motion, you begin to wonder and say, hey, I may need to be in motion too. And so what I did was, I, I guess kind of I confused motion and political engagement um, uh, with, with um, meaningfulness and the rest and then didn't, didn't realize that the full influence that one could try to have as a lawyer or a judge. But I, I just, there were times when everything was going on around it. I just, in law school, I just couldn't sit still. And I wondered what, what was the relevance of it all because a lot of these first year courses, see, we, we were talking about bailments. Um, and, you know, we were talking about, we were talking about future interests. I mean, get real. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and we, we were, and so I'm saying, this is not connected to anything. I mean, what is it? Pearson v. Post and the law of finders and some fox running out somewhere. <laughs> in a case. And I'm saying, these, these private law courses, they're not relating to anything that I want to be relating to. And so I just felt, Restless, and so Linwood Holton, who was the governor of Virginia, said, "Come on by, you know. Come on, let's 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 build up the Republican Party in the South. It was a one-party state at that time, Virginia." And he said, "You got You got to get into this." And I said, "You bet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go." So it was, it was, it was, it was restless. It was restlessness. Would you recommend it? <laughs> Yeah, you know, in an odd sense, I've made lots of lots of mistakes in my life, but running for Congress wasn't one of them. And um, I I got clobbered to get it. My opponent was a three-term Democrat, and if you're trying to run at the height of the Vietnam War as a 25-year-old student in a very traditional congressional district, you are going to go <laughs> absolutely nowhere. And so my. <laughs> My opponent runs this big billboard and he says, um, send Satterfield back to Congress and Wilkinson back to school. <laughs> I mean, I mean, ouch! And that's with an exclamation point. <laughs> um, so uh, the, this, this very, very diminishing slogan is being run in all the media around the um, district. Um, and at the End of the thing, I, did, the, the, I remember the day after the election, I was beaten two to one, and I was a Republican nominee, and I, and I, the television anchor said to me, well, what do you, what do you, what's the lesson you draw from this election? I said, well, I think I got a big mandate. And uh, <laughs> he said, I could see, he said, a mandate, yeah. I said, a mandate to get back to law school, <laughs> and in a hurry. Um, but I was glad I ran because I, I, you know, all of us grow up in very, very sheltered uh, environments and we associate a lot of times with folks like ourselves. And there's nothing like a race for Congress to get you to know people who are very different from yourself. And hey, that's what America's all about. And so politics launches you broad into a district and, and you're just dealing with a whole lot of people who have very disparate and different views, who think very differently from your view, and you know what? You're listening. You're listening. You can't replicate that experience um, elsewhere. So uh, I made a, uh, it would have been a terrible mistake not to have completed law school, but it was not a terrible mistake to, to uh, run for Congress and to continue political activity. So I'm curious, um one of the, you mentioned, you know, there are mistakes I've made, that wasn't one of them. And I think one of the things that makes the book so moving is your honesty about where you think you fell short uh, and where you, I don't know if regrets are the right word, but I'm thinking about the school newspaper 
incident and, oh, that and was terrible. you know and and people don't people don't write those things about themselves and it I think it's incredibly brave. Um, well, I'm, 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 I've made some bad mistakes and um, and and one of them was the one of them was the school newspaper. I was the editor of it at Lawrenceville, which is a boarding school in New Jersey, and. Um, I had, Lawrenceville was, was segregated at the time, and I had the chance um, to write an editorial uh, saying it is very important that we desegregate and become a more inclusive school. And, um, you know, well, I, I, I could have written that editorial and I didn't write it. And uh, I'm ashamed of myself. And, Another mistake I think I made, I, uh, this one was earlier as a, as a teenager, but I, I, I talk about what it was like to grow up in the segregated South, and uh, segregation took very, very different forms. In the, in the uh, Deep South, it was, it was, uh, uh, was, was very vocal and, and, and just openly bigoted and where I grew up in Richmond it was it was a lot of it was more subtle but it was because of that it was probably harder to root out and and I didn't recognize until way way later how much the silences of segregation could visit cruelty and hurt as much as overt expressions of bigotry and and racism and just Little things um, like I, you know, I, we we played tennis at the Country Club of Virginia, and I th I thought it was the greatest place in the world because they rolled and watered the courts, and they were nicest courts in Richmond. And, you know, um, Arthur Ashe was playing across town. Uh, we never let him in, not to hit one ball. A nice man. I didn't recognize all this stuff. Um, why was nobody in the South of the 1950s, in Richmond of the 1950s, where, why were no white Richmonders Brooklyn Dodgers fans? Why weren't they? We were Yankees fans. Senators fans, Reds fans, Cardinals fans. They weren't Dodgers fans. Why weren't we Dodgers fans? Because Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb and Junior Gilliam played for the Dodgers. And look, folks, in the Richmond of the 1950s and early 1960s, if you were a Dodgers fan and you made that known, it was very, very bad for business. You were going to lose a lot of white customers. And every nook and cranny, there was something going on that was cruel and wrong and ever so silent. It was part of a rhythm that was embedded in the fabric of life. And I have been too slow to recognize it. Now, you try to make amends, and I think in my professional life, I've been very clear about where I stand, but it's not unfair to expect teenagers to be sensitive to injustice or an editor of a boarding school paper to be sensitive to injustice. That was a mistake. Very few people we have at the law school, or I think any of us see speak anywhere, speak that way about their own past, about mistakes they've made, and it's it's unbelievably touching. 
and impressive. Um, and it's what comes across, I think, as at the center of the book is your humanity and your self-criticism um, and your own wrestling with what you felt as loss, the struggles you faced, and the, the changes that you saw as necessary and the challenges that had to be overcome at the same time as recognizing the humanity of the loss. And I, I think that's a, that's a really challenging thing. And, um, well, I feel, you know, later in life I've had to get this out. That's why I write the memoir, and I'm working on a novel now, which is a novel of forgiveness, and it, it's titled A Novel of Forgiveness, and it, it, it uh, uh, explores the theme of forgiveness, and, and when do you forgive someone, when do you not, when do we deserve forgiveness, when do we not, but this memoir, I had to get this out. And um, this, this novel I'm, I'm trying to explore uh, the theme of forgiveness, but it's, it's hard to find the time sometime because, you know, my day job is, pre <laughs> is, is, is pretty demanding and that's, that's my, that's my first, first obligation by far. In fact, the dean would wrap my knuckles if he thought I was spending too much time on anything other than the law. <laughs> well, I won't because I appreciate the writing that you have done outside of the law. Uh, so I'm going to ask you one more question because I have to, uh, just like you've been looking for an opportunity to talk about your feelings about my deanship. I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question because I have the opportunity and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, one of my very favorite Law Review articles of all time is your 1977 article co-authored with G. Edward White, who's still on our <laughs> faculty, called Constitutional Protections for Personal Lifestyles. I recommend it highly to anyone. And you say, and this is 1977, personal tastes, preferences, impulses, and expressions appear to be candidates for a new constitutional protection. No recent constitutional trend, in fact, seems more significant uh, and then you say, we conclude that certain within certain limits, judicial protection of personal lifestyle choices is constitutionally warranted and socially desirable that the court reaffirms its historic function by protecting lifestyle choices, but that indiscriminate and unreasoned vindication of lifestyle freedoms is no more desirable than insensitivity to them. And I'm, I'm curious what you make of that article today, how it fits in with the thesis of the book. It's... I can't, I can't recommend it enough. And it's always struck me that in 1977, lots of people, if they had seen that trend, would have thought it was over by then. You know, we're well into the Burger Court. It's not the Warren Court anymore. And, um, and, and I just would love to hear you uh, reflect on it. Well, well, thanks. I, I think that my... Um, I think whether, whether it is a constitutional matter, um, I have concerns about. I think I've developed a concern about uh, importing too many substantive rights into the due process clause because uh, the word due process seems to me to suggest um, procedure and because the uh, the due process clause is so capacious and open-ended, it's a wide open range. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very cautious about over-constitutionalizing this area. But I think, in a, and I hope, in a deeper sense, and by the way, it was a wonderful experience to, to write with a, a person like Ted White, who just was a wonderful collaborator. Um, I hope in a deeper sense I remain very committed to that article because it expresses a view of mine that there is no reason to disrespect other people's lifestyle choices. It's no reason to, to disrespect eccentricities or differences. So I'm very proud of that article because it, 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 it has expressed something 
that I hope has stayed with me and that always will. And that is you approach your fellow human beings with an embrace. And I think that's what Ted and I were basically trying to get at. There's an important question about when and whether it should be constitutionalized, but there shouldn't ever be an important question about the fact that human dignity is universal. And if you don't believe that, then you hardly believe anything worthwhile. And so that article expresses that view. And that's why I remain committed to it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, will you take a few questions? Sure. OK. The floor is open for questions. And Dean Kendrick has a microphone so that we can capture your questions. So raise your hand, and she'll come around to you. Thank you for your talk, sir. I was hoping to ask after uh, what you think of the pathology of the 1960s that did the damage, and how? what about it made it tempting, and what can be done today to make it either less tempting or an alternative that is less damaging but can still achieve the good style effects that it did in the 60s more attractive by comparison? Well. I think the um, I, I, I think the fundamental drawback of the 1960s was that it it posited that the individual could remain supreme to the general judgment in too many instances, and um, I and and this. I've been criticized for, but I, but I, 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 I stand by it. That some of the things that were unleashed in the 1960s, um, which is that you have a right to civil disobedience without facing consequences, and that um, the uh, riots and assassinations and the campus disruptions of that, dec of that decade. The, the question I have is, what connection did that bear to 9-11? Uh, because once, it's very, it's very difficult to contain zealotry. And once you unleash the consuming fires of zealotry, where is the cutoff point? Where is the ending point? And um, when, when I was when I when I hear about nineteen uh, when I hear, was thinking about nine eleven, bombing of the Pentagon and the, um, and the uh, terrible loss of life at the at the, at the uh, World Trade Center, um, and then when I think about these um, some of these uh, deeply misguided idealists, if that's what they are, that engage in these rampa rampages. Um, I see a reflection in the 1960s is that if only you are convinced enough of your self-purity and the righteousness of cause, your cause, that you are entitled to do anything that will hasten the arrival of your own right and perfect day. And it's establishing the individual as the supreme arbiter, as opposed to the general judgments of society, um, as a consensus to which we owe respect, that I think is the essential pathology of the 60s. And that, in, in my judgment, um, all of those who are committed to law uh, need to um, rebut it every, in every responsible way. Hi. Uh, thank you again for coming here. I was just wondering, this is between 
between on the one hand where you speak of your regret at, at the silence of largely the white community in Richmond in the um, 50s, 60s in the face of racial injustice and then you express regret at um, disturbances now, referencing Ferguson, Baltimore, among others. Um, I, I guess I just wonder what your thoughts are on on whom the burden falls of injustice at any one time. And in an ideal world, I would agree with you, we would all resort, you know, take recourse through Congress and the courts, et cetera, et cetera. But in times where there are injustices, and, and you very eloquently recognized that, it feels like it's the silence that drives people who are facing that injustice to extra legal options. And I just wonder if you could speak to, yeah. is there, isn't there a greater responsibility on like white men such as myself to not be silent in the face of these things? Because how can we possibly expect oppressed people to operate under a system that benefits us and doesn't benefit them, and then we're just going to have some, you know, epiphany? Well, I have two responses. First of all, you need to say what you believe. And uh, just, just be yourself and enter the dialogue and enter the discussion. Um, and uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, it's such a cliche, but, but if you're true to yourself, then you can't be false to any, any other person. And so um, is a very satisfying way to live if you say what you and your heart believe and are willing to let some chips fall where they may and, and some consequences fall where they may. It takes enormous courage at times, um, but it's worthwhile go to, go to pursue. The other point of your question was where does the, where does the burden fall in, rec in, in recognizing um, and in calling out injustice. Um, and that's a little difficult because it's, um, it, it, it's, it's difficult because it's not as easy as assigning a burden of proof in, in, in the law. Um, and uh, the, 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 the differences in our society lie not so much in 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 um, in ends, but in means. Let's posit this: we all disagree. We, we would all recognize as an injustice great inequalities of income. All right, we we agree on that. But that general recognition at that general level leaves unanswered the question about what means we should adopt to alleviate those and what the side effects of those means are and whether that creates other injustices. There are a thousand questions that arise about means after you identify a single, posit a single important end. Now, it's the job of law to mediate differences over means the job of legislation, uh, the, job of, um, uh, the job of judicial decisions, law and, and all of its forms is really involved in, in mediating differences in society over means. And it's, it's uh, a part, I think, of the failure of the 1960s was a failure to recognize that there could be legitimate differences over means. And that just because one was passionate about an end, it didn't mean that you could adopt any means to achieve that end. And law is, is the vehicle we have settled upon as a society to mediate those very difficult, hard value choices, I mean, choices as to means, both, both the ones that are gonna work, the ones that aren't, and the ones that are, as what's so devilishly hard in a society that's this complex, 
the ones that are going to set in motion all kinds of unintended consequences. When we, when we sometimes I think a definition of virtue is to um, know everything you you don't know. I try to approach approach a case that way. What not what do I know, but what are all the things that I do not know? What are the limits of knowledge? And when you realize what the, the, your own limits of knowledge, and you adopt, then you have a certain humility and respect for the fact that knowledge is collective, um, and that you need to listen to others and hear other points of view. And it was it was that essential lack of humility that was so disturbing about the 1960s and 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 the think in the thought that the whole basket that the whole thing lay in the identification of some idealistic end and not willing to dis discuss means i hope that answers your your question it was it's just, it's a very good one one more question right That actually answered, that was part of my question, but I can, um, I thank you so much for speaking and um, being so open. I think it's it's really interesting to hear you be so introspective about your own silence in the 60s and, and um, also talk about collective responsibility for um, the ills of the 60s, which you now see reflected in now, because it really seems like, um, it seems like assigning blame or responsibility collectively uh, kind of excuses some of the backlash or equivocate some of the backlash with the people who are, um, even if you might say the means aren't as productive as you might hope or what you might wish. Um, so I, it seems like a form of false equivalency, especially now when we have um, full-throated support of white supremacy from the White House. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I have, a, I have a hearing problem. I'm sorry. I have a hearing problem, and the harder your questions get, the harder my hearing becomes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it, with a mic, I'm even tempted to talk to speak quieter than I would if I didn't have a mic. But um, so hearing you speak um, so eloquently and, and openly about your own silence um, in the '60s, um, it, and, and, and con contrasting that with your kind of idea about how we should have collective responsibility for um, the the ills that result from um, protest and and kind of uh, extra legal means um, not for protesting but from rioting or you know yeah I, I also think I would also just question a false equivalency between terror violent terrorism assassination and property destruction which may be violent in some sense but not the same sense um, but my question is just you, you know how do you, do you do you feel troubled by or do you feel like that's an accurate critique that there's a, there's a false equivalency there between the people protesting or the people demanding uh, action on the one hand and the people who are maybe reacting against it, um, they're uncomfortable, they're made uncomfortable by it. You're talking about a false equivalency in terms of property destruction and personal, uh, and, and personal harm? That, but, but more so um, between the, the um, responsibility for what you, what you say, are the, the, the ills and the, the negative results of um, extra legal means towards social action and the reaction on the other side, which you, which you seem to also acknowledge is destructive, but to me seems more blameworthy. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that the, uh, what you term as a, as a, a false equivalencies, um, it strikes me that you're one of the things you're talking about is um, uh, differences of degree, and um, one of the things law is reasonably good at um, is is in delineating gradations. Um, the basic gradation being, for example, that between a basic one being between misdemeanor and a felony. And um, it, uh, it, it, you know, it seems to me that when, when one starts looking at, 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 at protest and when one starts looking at various harms and everything, 
Th those strike me as, as all as matters of, of gradation. Um, I'm, I, I'm very much into the uh, business of um, balancing uh, things, and I don't think that's a, that's a cop-out when, when one deals with, with uh, free, free speech. Uh, the question seems to me sometimes less global than trying to pick out the really appropriate balance in a time, place, and manner restriction. But um, I, I guess to the extent that I'm being fair to your question, I, I, would, uh, I would just say that there are different, different gradations, and one, thing's the law, one thing the law does well is it, 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 it can get pretty granular and it, can get, it, it, it does have an ability to fine-tune. Thank you all for coming. I hope you, I trust and am confident that you agree with you with me that this was really um, a very special conversation. And uh, please join me in thanking the unbelievable, wonderful, distinguished, honest, humane Judge Wilkinson. Thank you.